Uh, bonjour tout le monde. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the first sleep salon of a new research creation project, The Sociability of Sleep. My name is Alana Thane. I'm a professor at McGill University. I'm the director of the Moving Image Research Lab and the collective for research on epistemologies of embodied risk. And um, I'm one of the co-directors of The Sociability of Sleep, along with Professor Alexandra Kaminska to my left um, of University de Montréal, who is co-director of the Artifact Lab in Media Studies and of the Brico Lab, a space for research creation and making. We're so delighted to be here with you today. And I'd really especially like to thank the Sociability of Sleep's residence postdoctoral fellow, uh, Dr. Josh Dittrich, who's just over here as well, and our research assistant, Charlene Auré, for their very hard work to get the salons up and running. I'm gonna to begin today with a land acknowledgement. The Sociability of Sleep project is physically located in Jojage, Montreal, and is situated on the traditional and unceded territory of the Ganyagahaka. We recognize with gratitude that they are the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet, live, and rest. Jojage has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst many First Nations, including the Ganyagahaka of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron Wondat, Abenaki and Anishinaabeg peoples. I'd also like to share an acknowledgement developed by my colleagues at the Feminist Media Studio at Concordia for our pandemic forms of assembly. While Zoom is the technical custodian of the platform on which we gather, this makes us no less occupants of the multiple territories on which we're all physically located. This platform doesn't emerge out of the ether. It's a product of Silicon Valley, a unicorn valued at $35 billion five years since launching. It became a publicly traded company in 2019, and its shares are up more than 500% since social distancing measures were enacted in 2020. Zoom's headquarters are located on Moekma Ohlone territory. And the Ohlone have historically understood about sustainability, about communal societies, and about giving gifts to those who pass by, and about sharing space. Their horizontal organization might inspire different emergent models of peer-to-peer -peer networking in the pandemic than we're enacting here in Zoom. We see Zoom as a platform which connects us and also which alienates us from the aims of restitution, justice, and reparation. So I'd also like to take a minute to introduce the larger project behind these sleep salons. The Sociability of Sleep is funded by the Government of Canada's New Frontiers and Research Fund. It's an interdisciplinary research creation project exploring the epistemologies and equities of sleep. We're interested in both the everyday and the exceptional experiences of sleep and its disturbances. And at the heart of our project is the understanding that in sleep, we all become radically vulnerable in a way that requires social forms of care. People are experts of their own somatic experience. And yet access to the sleeping self relies on the perceptions of humans and technological others. So how might exploring a kind of sleeper subjectivity, the quotidian ways we navigate time, space, ourselves and others, help us rethink and reanimate the sociability of sleep itself. Across societies and cultures, we see traces of sleep from shift work to overwork, from racial and gendered inequities to cultural alterities, from lucid dreams to dream engineering, from stigmatization of fatigue to the burgeoning of sleep apps, technologies, and the sleep industrial complex. And these are some of the manifestations of the social lives of sleep. Through this project and its collaborations, we're trying to generate new knowledge and empathies for sleep conditions and disabilities, defined as generating a disordered and debilitating relation between sleep and wakefulness, and is affecting long-term health and quality of life. We're a team made up of film and media scholars, artists, and researchers in psychiatry, psychology, and medicine. And we're exploring together how the tools and methods of arts, humanities, and social sciences can enrich knowledge, understanding, and normative treatments of sleep conditions, as well as the collective care of all sleepers. Our approach is really rooted in art science experimentation, collaboration, prototyping, and various forms of critical making that integrate and engage with qualitative and quantitative research data. And our ongoing and pragmatic goal is to generate novel sleep situations that might make perceptible and thus actionable our key intuition, which is that sleep is much more social than it might seem. Over the next two years of the project, we'll host a series of experimental events, including maker labs, prototyping workshops, artist residencies, a summer school, and a final exhibition. In, in January, we have a grad student colloquium in, in the works. So if you're a grad student here in Montreal working on sleep, please get in touch. In the chat, 
You can also find links to upcoming talks by our team members at the Salon, the Society for Literature, Science and the Arts and at 4S and uh, also to the rest of the fall sleep salons. The sleep salons are one of the main ways that we're seeking to connect to the wide and diverse community of sleep researchers to understand how we're thinking about the social lives of sleep. So in the chat, you can also find a link to our website landing page, which is still under construction, but where eventually you can find everything. Um, currently though, you can find their information about the upcoming sleep salons and get more information about the project. Please reach out if you're interested in learning more about collaborating, and you can also follow us on Facebook or social media to keep up with project events. So while we um, initially dreamed up the salons as a live event, we're adapting to current circumstances as best we can. We invite you as audience members to take part in two ways. During the salon, please feel free to use the chat to share thoughts, comments, relevant links um, that our discussion today brings up for you. The salons are being recorded, they'll be shared on our website, and we'll also include an edited list of um, things that people bring up during the conversation um, as a kind of public resource. There'll also be a Q&A after our speakers, and I'll be sharing your questions as you post them in the chat. We invite you to turn on your cameras uh, for the conversation, but maybe in the interests of time and Zoom fatigue, I'll be asking questions on your behalf during the Q&A. And you should, of course, feel free to leave your camera off the whole time if you like to lie down or do whatever you need to do to be able to be here today. Um, we'll do our best to accommodate all the questions in the order in which they're received. Um, we might not get to all of them. Please note that the discussion can, of course, continue over social media. Um, I turn now to our speakers. We have two speakers today, Dr. Matthew Wolf Mayer and Carmela Alcantara who are each gonna be responding to our prompt about how they address the sociability of sleep in their research. And I'll just note that like, and perhaps I'm missing other people, but we have two other speakers from our sleep salons, our upcoming series, uh, Franny Noodleman and also Benjamin Reese who are here in the audience. Welcome, thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, I'm gonna to introduce our two speakers for today. They're gonna to speak for about 25 minutes each, and then we'll open the floor to questions and discussions. Our first speaker is Matthew Wolf Mayer the author of The Slumbering Masses, Sleep Medicine in Modern American Life um, from Minnesota Press from 2012, a Theory for the World to Come, Speculative Fiction and Apocalyptic Anthropology from 2019, and Unraveling, Remaking Personhood in a Neurodiverse Age from 2020. His research focuses on the biology of everyday life, effective approaches to subjectivity and post-human ethics. He's currently a senior research fellow in Tampere's Tampere University's Institute for Advanced Study and a member of their faculty of social sciences. So Matthew, I turn it over to you. Um, hello. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for the invitation um, to come back and talk about sleep one more time. Um, I keep joking that I feel like I've retired from sleep and then people reel me back in. So, and I also try and do something new. So hopefully this is entirely new and yet totally old at the same time. I am not a great extemporaneous speaker. Um, and so I'm gonna read you something. Um, I'm dropping a link to an access copy of the talk into the chat in case you want a PDF of it. I'm going to share my screen with you. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so but, uh, I, I will also tell you uh, right up front that the um, slideshow is just so you have something different to look at than looking at me. Um, so it's mostly just pretty pictures. And I hope that's OK. Um, so one of the things I'm working on right now is a book about the biology of everyday life, and it's kind of based on a class that I teach where we spend a bunch of time looking at different physiological processes and um, how like uh, they're shaped socially, right? Um, and it really tries to kind of reimagine what human nature is in the context of contemporary capitalism and the way that, uh, that capitalism shapes 
human experience in very particular kinds of ways. Um, and I started to teach the class because people asked me if I would teach a class about sleep. And I was like, I don't want to teach a class about sleep, but I'll try and teach a class where sleep is one of the things that we talk about. So in the context of that class, um, we talk about sleep in relationship to um, menstruation and menopause to think about time and the human experiences of time over the life course. So the talk that I'm about to read is kind of the first foray into a chapter version of that section of the class in a way, um, but it doesn't have anything to do with menstruation. It's, I just tried to do the sleep stuff. So we'll see how it goes. I'm really open to any feedback that you have about it um, and, and know that it's kind of partial. So, um, with that, <clears throat> um, uh, so my research on sleep began with my interest in what uh, Henri Lefebvre referred to as rhythm analysis, or the study of a society's spatiotemporal organization. Imagining a bird's eye view of a city, Lefebvre wanted a way to conceptualize the periods of activity and rest over the course of a day, the work week, and beyond. Rhythm analysis captures the synchronization of traffic lights, the impact of traffic jams, the lines for coffee and takeout, the flushing of toilets and washing of hands, the coming and going from work and school, family and individual meals, and recreation and bedtime. These rhythms are made by the institutional demands on individuals and their families, the structure of the workday and the school day, and actualized by the infrastructures that facilitate the movement of bodies and the goods they consume, which may or may not ease these processes in their imposition of their own rhythms. Fundamentally, for Lefebvre, these everyday experiences were shaped by consumer capitalism, but a similar approach could be applied to any society to come to a comparative understanding of how social organization and physiological processes are shaped by economic forces. Like a maximalist urban planning, rhythm analysis seeks to capture the macro level events that make up everyday life at the aggregate scale and their seriality and variations. So the workday, school day, work and school week, holidays and school breaks, and thereby establishes a kind of baseline organizational conception of the normal and the regular. What rhythm analysis is less good at is grasping the subjective experience of how spatiotemporal organization shapes individuals, families, and communities. With rhythm analysis guiding me, I set about to study what happens at night to maintain diurnal everyday life. I was interested in policing, waste removal, trucking goods from place to place, the social life of late night diners, and the restocking of consumer goods. It was a project based in many respects in transit and infrastructure, and was formed by Murray Melvin's Night is Frontier, one of the few books I could find at the time that had anything sociological to say about nightlife. At the time, I was a night owl, routinely awake until 4 or 5 a.m. and asleep until 11 a.m. or noon. My schedule seemed to align with my interests, and I had the secondary benefit of justifying field work that started after dinner for most people, took me to bars and clubs, and ended my quote-unquote days at diners with overnight workers as they stopped for lunch or coffee. I lived with a friend who largely ignored my comings and goings, and we were both able to sleep through the other's workday. With that backdrop, I thought that I would write one chapter about what everyone else was doing while the nocturnal activities I was interested in were taking place and plan to write a chapter about sleep. I reached out to the director of the local sleep clinic to arrange a visit and develop a sense of what the science and medicine of sleep was interested in and then quickly realized during a staff meeting where individual case histories of patients were discussed that focusing on sleep allowed me to do the rhythm analysis I was drawn to, albeit from a perspective that situated individuals and their families at the forefront. Focusing on sleep and its disorders and how they've been articulated in the US from the 19th century through the present provided purchase on how ideas about the normal have been shaped around ideas about biology and human nature and how those ideas of nature have become the basis for the otherwise relatively arbitrary structure of the everyday. Focusing on disordered sleepers also foregrounded an intimate physiological process that was impacted by the rhythms of everyday life and showed how an individual rhythm could be the source of friction between assumptions about universal human nature and individual experiences of disorder. 
So through cross-cultural and historical studies of sleeping practices, it's been well established that consolidated nightly sleep is neither universal nor universally desired. Reading the cross-cultural literature on sleep arrangements, it's been well demonstrated that in the North Atlantic, consolidated nightly sleep is an effect of industrialization and the widespread use of industrial lighting in the middle and late 19th century, and that previous to that period, people slept in biophasic fashion with two or more periods of sleep during a 24-hour day. Cross-culturally, the prevalence of siesta cultures in the tropics is, is well established and continues today with some modifications to adjust to the workday as it's developed in places like Spain and Taiwan. Similarly, while Americans tend to focus on training infants to sleep alone, either in their own bed, in a shared bedroom, or in the infant's own room, families around the world share their beds with infants and children. In each of these ways, the social patterns around sleep, when people sleep, who they sleep with, and in what arrangements, support the broader organization of society and reflect dominant expectations about bodies, their changes over time, and the relationships between family members and between families and society at large. The organization of sleep also undergirds the rhythms of society and has a tendency to impose conceptions, uh, uh, sorry, has the tendency to impose a conception of society's diurnal temporal organization as being based in human biology. But the naturalization of sleep in society in this way is an inscription of institutionalized power structures that are based in capitalism and its exploitation of laboring populations. <clears throat> Individual lives are usually conceptualized along lines of human development and life course in sociology and anthropology. In developmental models, individuals come, move from one stage to the next, generally associated with age and maturation. When an individual does not meet normative standards for development, they're treated as disabled and in need of intervention. A quote unquote successful intervention in a developmental model restores an individual to the implanted developmental trajectory. In life course models, individuals achieve status along a trajectory associated with institutionalized benchmarks, school graduation, employment, marriage, and parenthood, which are in the context of capitalist societies associated with the state in terms of the dispensation of rights, the extraction of resources through labor and taxation, and the disciplining of individuals to meet normative standards. Where de developmental models might tend toward a medical medicalized intervention, life course models tend toward institutional in interventions. If these models help to describe individual trajectories, what they sometimes miss is the complexity of intertwined lives and how the pace or inflections of one life um, affects families, communities, and the institutions that individuals and families interact with. Conceptualizing an individual's rhythm over the course of a day, week, month, year, and life captures the interplay between lives and institutions. Mismatches in rhythms expose the disjunctures that are often created by the institutional demands on the everyday lives of individuals, their families, and their communities. So now at age 45, <clears throat> employed and married with two children aged 10 and 6, my daily rhythms are substantially different from the period of my dissertation fieldwork. My eldest child wakes up routinely at 6 a.m. without an alarm clock, despite not needing to be to school until 7.50. The younger child grumpily rolls out of bed to his alarm clock an hour later. After putting the children to bed, I tend to fall asleep around 10.30 and wake up between 2.30 and 4 a.m., and after being awake for two to four hours, go back to sleep until eight or 9 a.m. Meanwhile, my partner routinely stays up until midnight or later and wakes with the children around 6.30 to see them off to school. We have the relative, relatively flexible situation of two university professors, neither of whom has to teach too early in the morning this semester, and the added benefit of a marriage that comprises two relatively complementary desires for sleep. Without school and work demands on our time, the schedule is only slightly modified with the younger child sleeping until eight or nine each morning. The rhythms of our household are grounded in the patterns of sleep that comprise our shared and individual periods of wakefulness and sleep. That set of rhythms is punctuated by departures for school and work, the preparation and eating of meals, which largely occur together, individual trips to the bathroom, 
daily hygiene routines and weekly chores like laundry and cleaning the house. Those rhythms are shaped by monthly and annual events, holidays, travel, inclement weather, illness, and a rhythm analysis of our family life would both capture the day-to-day -day rhythms, the weekly variations, and the macroscopic changes over the course of the year. Borrowing from life course analysis, it might also track changes over the intertwined lives of family members as periods of intense caregiving from parents to children lessen over time and potentially become inverted in our old age. A rhythm analysis would also describe how our periods of activity interact with each other and how, during periods of dormancy, different activities become possible for individual family members, like my eldest child's quiet reading time in the early morning and my middle of the night writing periods. Here, building on Lefebvre's rhythm analysis, I want to consider both rhythm and dormancy to capture the interplay of periods of wakefulness and sleep and their social functions. I counterpoise dormancy um, to cessation and draw on the history of sleep to consider how binary on and off conceptions of biology obscures how physiological processes are ongoing and have rhythmic effects, even when they are not apparent. Dominant rhythms of society tend to obscure how periods of dormancy are also periods of activity that work to enable, smooth, uh, enable the smooth functioning of everyday life. Returning to that germ of an alternate dissertation I could have written but didn't, this is all to argue that dormancy is integral to the functioning of the everyday and that dormancy is always only a period of rest from certain perspectives. The challenge with dormancy is that it can also devalue specific processes and people from certain dominant perspectives. One person's dormancy is another person's period of intense activity. So during my fieldwork at a sleep clinic, the neurologists and psychiatrists often confronted patients and popular ideas about the body ceasing functioning while asleep. The expectation that many people brought into the clinic was that the brain ceased to function and while they were sleeping. And although it was dreaming, that dreaming was a surplus function of cessation and not important. Some of the clinicians thought that too. Rather than the sensory processing and thought that made up everyday life and was valued, the sleeping brain was accepted as ceasing activity and was awaiting reactivation upon awakening. Instead, the clinic staff usually argued that the brain was just doing different activities, which were easily demonstrable um, with the various visualization technologies they had access to in the clinic. It was clear based upon EKG readings that the brain was hard at work, but the work that it was doing was different than what Americans tend to think brains are used for and what they value as activity. Sleep, from the perspective of the clinicians, was accepted as a dormant period, although this is not the language being used, and not a period of cessation as patients and their families tended to assume. From the perspective of the clinician, cessation would be death. Dormancy, however, captures how the body is waiting, that it's in a period of activity, activity different than usual daytime demands, and that it's in an in interstitial state between one period of social activity and the next. In its dormancy, a sleeping body is acting just in a way that is imperceptible to most observers and in contradiction to dominant beliefs about bodies and the processes that are valued in capitalist societies. So dormancy is critical for capturing uh, human product, uh, uh, capturing human productive activity and is distinct from the docility that disciplinary institutions rely on for the control of individuals and populations. If docility is uh, associated with the spatio-temporal regulation of a society where specific bodies are meant to be in specific places at specific times, it's less about what those bodies are doing than where they are. Their docility is predicated on what is available to them in the spaces they inhabit. As children in school and prisoners in a cell demonstrate, activity can remain constant if constrained in its potential. Dormancy, however, is a state change between one kind of activity and another. The period of dormancy may prepare in material or abstract ways a body for its entry into another period of activity as sleep does before a day of school or work, but it might also mark a period of activity that is distinct and transitionary. 
if docility means being fixed in location in relation to the dominant rhythm of society, dormant bodies are differentiated in being spatially mobile and having the quality of their activities accepted as less vital to society than non-dormant social actors. Dormancy also captures um, let's, let's see, the pulsing rhythm of urban life, helping to describe both the dominant rhythm of the work and school days, as well as the interplay between the dominant rhythm and its minor supporting variations. From the bird's eye view of rhythm analysis, the city is a hub of activity during the day while the suburbs go dormant. And this is inverted at night when, with the return home of children and workers and with home life becoming active and the city center going dormant. But in both cases, within the dormant field, there are spaces of activity, just not activity that abides by the dominant demand of the spatiotemporal order of capitalist societies. Instead, the dormant activities in the non-dominant space support the dominant rhythm of society, as, for example, children attending a school in the suburbs while parents work in the city center, or as garbage removal occurs in the city center while workers sleep at home in the suburbs. This is all rather idealized. And the actual occurrence of these processes is subject to all of the typical challenges of coordinated human activity. But this rhythmic model provides an image of social activity and dormancy that demonstrates how sleep as dormancy serves as a counterpoint to the dominant rhythm of society, at once reinforcing it and serving as a possible source of friction and disruption. Sleep, sleep is an exquisite example of how, on an everyday basis, human physiological experiences are coordinated with social structures and human dormancy is situated to maintain the productivity of communities. With sleep, this coordination occurs across the life course with differential effects for children, adults, and elders. It can also um, be uncoordinated in that schools and work times for many families do not align to ensure positive outcomes for all family members. For example, um, in many school districts in the US, elementary age students attend school earlier than high school age students, despite evidence that high schoolers require more sleep and have later sleep onset times. Beyond that, elementary age students end up being released from school before parents' uh, working days are over. The result is a care crisis and that parents require support to care for their children for a short period of time, either paying for childcare or relying on family or community members to take care of them. Students at all levels awaken early to facilitate the schedule. Starting school later, beginning when the adult workday starts, would solve the care crisis after school for many families while also allowing the students to sleep later. When proposals to change these school times are floated to school boards and communities, the biggest challenge is often after school events like sports, which resist being rescheduled to before school starts. The result is that a small number of students who participate in voluntary after school activities have a systemic effect requiring the vast majority of students to find care after school. One socially valued period of activity, in this case, after school sports, renders a wide swath of students dormant as they wait for parents to pick them up while being cared for in after school programs or by community and kin. In my early 20s, I worked for what was then Kinko's in the United States. My schedule uh, was weekend nights, and I worked from 10 p.m. until 8 a.m., often alone out in the suburbs of Detroit. A six-lane thoroughfare passed in front of the store, which during the day was busy as drivers entered and exited a nearby highway that served as a main artery to Detroit and its more approximate suburbs. At night, however, the thoroughfare was empty and I would routinely walk out to stand in the middle of the street and listen to the silence of the night. The after bar drivers of two to 3 a.m. would give way to total silence of empty streets by four, which would slowly become more populated between five and six before blooming into rush hour between six and seven as suburban workers made their way into the city center. I would sometimes stand in the road until a car appeared, just waiting while the machines inside the store lumbered through their production schedules. <clears throat> My coworkers were less nocturnal than I was, and many of them took naps and complained about the financial situations that compelled them to take the night shift, which paid slightly better than working during the day. In many ways, that set of experiences predisposed me to fondly receive Lefebvre's call for rhythm analysis when I first encountered it. What other than capitalism 
could impel people to work at cross purposes to their physiological needs and biologized desires. One coworker who I'll call Marshall here would leave work early on Monday mornings to see his children off to school, wake up when they came home to prepare dinner and then come to work around his children's bedtime. His arrangement of his work and sleep was exquisite in its ability to fit into the care needs of his family and the structure of the night shift. But he was also miserable and never really able to commit to a nocturnal lifestyle. He would shift to a daytime period of activity when not working, resulting in heavy caffeine use during his work shifts. Marshall's experience of working during the night, a period of dormancy, is a caricature of the problems associated with shift work. But it also shows, shows how a period of dormancy can be capitalized upon by individuals and families to meet their needs for care, which echoes the way <clears throat> uh, that gendered labor throughout the 20th century was associated with women and domesticity. In this respect, anxieties about 24-hour societies might largely be accepted as a problem for men, as women's care um, in the for or, uh, care labor has always been a 24-hour commitment, the reality of which is obscured by its association with dormancy. The rhythm of care exposes how it's not simply one rhythm that dominates a society, but an interplay of rhythms that work together to create and support that dominant rhythm. The dominant rhythm of a society undergirded by the demands of capitalist production is a hegemonic one, and it conspires to make all rhythms subservient to its organization and the bodily experiences it produces. This may mean that there are complex interactions between dominant activities and dormant ones, but it can also mean that all activity is organized to support one dominant spatiotemporal organization. In situations where there is a diversity of rhythms that allow for a diversity of physiological experiences, more forms of sleep can be facilitated. In a hegemonic organization of rhythm, all activity is organized to facilitate capitalist production. What attending to the multi-rhythm organization of society opens up are the ways that even in a seemingly hegemonic situation, there are spaces where dormant bodies are active in ways that challenge and facilitate the dominant rhythm and creative in unexpected ways. That's the talk. And I'll, oh, I could have shown you more better images. Thank you so much, Matthew. I have, <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much. Um, I'm really looking forward to talking more, especially about dormancy um, in the Q&A. Um, let me introduce our second speaker for today. Dr. Carmela Alcantara is an associate professor and the associate dean for doctoral education at Columbia School of Social Work. She received a BA in psychology and sociology with a concentration in Latino studies from Cornell University and a PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Michigan. Dr. Alcantara also completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the WK Kellogg as a WK Kellogg Health Scholar in Social Epidemiology at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Her research examines the social determinants of sleep, mental health, and cardiovascular health, and the development of community-engaged and evidence-based behavioral interventions to promote health equity. Uh, Carmela, over to you. Excellent. Thank you so much for that um, wonderful introduction. It really is such a pleasure and delight to be part of the inaugural Sleep Salon and really looking forward to the um, dynamic and I think generative conversation. And it was exciting to also learn more about um, uh, Matthew's work. And uh, thank you to Professors Tain and Kaminska for the, for the invitation. What I thought I'd do today is uh, just share with you some um, I think reflections about the social dimensions of sleep based on my uh, research and insights uh, from my research that focuses on sleep health equity uh, with Latinx populations. So just a quick uh, outline. I, I want you know to really start first by uh, describing and providing an overview of sleep disparities, really giving a 50,000 foot view uh, since that you know, that, that work and those findings are really um, uh, essential to uh, and inform the work that I do. I then want to move on to talk about um, and share with you a framework that I use uh, that um, 
that's the social determinants of health framework in the research um, in my program of research that focuses on sleep health and Latinx populations, and really talk about what the social means within the context of this framework um, by focusing on two examples of um, research uh, on the effects of uh, acculturation stress and, and transnational ties on sleep health, and thinking about those two factors as social dimensions, and then conclude by sharing just some thoughts on insights and, and implications, and then looking forward forward to the Q&A. So now starting with that 50,000 foot view um, in this, I think we're in an audience of, of people and, and scholars who study this. So this may already be known information, but I'll just start. Um, in, in thinking about the US, we know that one in three US adults are what you'd consider sleepless uh, in the United States. Uh, and that is um, that they report a sleep duration of less than seven hours. There's substantial geographic um, variation in the prevalence of short sleep duration in the United States as shown in this, uh, in this figure. This can also be extended, you know, to uh, friends up north in Canada, and this is data that's coming from the Canadian Health Measures Survey that shows that between 53 to 60 percent of Canadian adults obtain recommended hours of sleep. So these are, you know, adults um, ages 18 and higher uh, who are obtaining between um, uh, seven to eight to seven to nine hours of sleep. And importantly, uh, however, these uh, sleep disturbances of which short sleep duration is one of them is not uniformly distributed across racial ethnic groups. And in fact, uh, racial ethnic minorities um, in the United States bear a disproportionate burden of sleep disturbances. The most consistent evidence has been found for short for sleep duration. So if you see here um, in that Asian, Black, Hispanic, or Latinx, and Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander, adults generally uh, suffer from short shorter uh, sleep durations compared to non-Hispanic Latinx whites. And you can see similar patterns if you focus on different dimensions of sleep, like sleep quality, sleepiness, and sleep complaints. Um, it's important to note that the sleep disturbances are not uniformly distributed, and the consequences of those sleep disturbances on health are also not uh, uniformly uh, distributed across the population. Um, you know, just sort of to sharing this, uh, um, sharing the uh, important um, results from a study that I was able to collaborate with colleagues where uh, they, it, was, it followed about 700 uh, patients who had suffered from a heart attack, so an acute coronary syndrome. It followed them for a year. It assessed for their sleep after um, they were discharged from the hospital um, using self-report, and then it followed them for a year to see what their outcomes were in terms of having another major adverse cardiovascular event. And what the data um, showed is that Black patients who slept less than seven hours had the highest risk of another major adverse cardiovascular event that would be either death, a heart attack, unstable angina compared to all, uh, all other groups. And this was you know, pretty consistent um, accounting for important medical factors, other sociodemographic factors. Um, so, you know, clearly the combination of uh, self-identified Black race, which we often talk about as, as a proxy really for hypothesized racism, exposure to racism, and the combination of less than seven hours was particularly cardiotoxic uh, for um, this population of adults with cardiovascular disease. And so in my program of research, I'm really, I'm really interested in this for um, not only sort of, you know, scholarly interest, but also because of the public health implications and wanting to really understand what contributes to these uh, health disparities, these health disparities, and also um, specifically what um, factors um, contribute to sleep health in, in health disparity populations as well. And for that, you know, uh, my, my work is informed by a social determinants of health framework, um, and social determinants can be uh, um, defined as the broad range of non-medical factors, uh, be it the social, economic, psychosocial, behavioral um, factors that directly or, or indirectly shape um, health outcomes. And in many ways, the focus on social determinants was a reaction to the medicalization of, of illness. And it really was, um, the goal was to really shift attention away from 
personal um, behavior and individual level factors to really look at the institutions, the social structures, uh, the, the contextual factors that influenced um, uh, and, and the relation and relationships that influence health or, or what you know the branch of um, epidemiology, social epidemiology um, really uh, um, emphasizes and, and studies it are the impacts of these social, again, non-medical factors on health. And I want to share with you this um, excellent sort of framework. I love this conceptual um, uh, visual from the World Health Organization that that really does an excellent job, I think, of laying out what does a social uh, determinants of health framework uh, focus on. On the on the on the left hand here, you see um, that there are structural determinants that have either you know direct effects on health and well-being or indirect effects through their um, impacts on these intermediary determinants, which I'll describe in just a moment. But if you start here at the left-hand side of the, of the model, these structural determinants are, are really the macroest level of factors um, that you could think of. So these would be factors related to the socioeconomic and political context. Um, so think about governance, macroeconomic policies, social policies, public policies, culture and societal values. And again, have these um, direct and in many ways indirect effects on health and well-being, and we can add sleep to that. Um, part of the, the structural determinants um, also would include how socioeconomic position factors, so that would be one socioeconomic status, uh, gender, uh, race, ethnicity, um, education, occupation, and income, how those factors also then in turn have both direct and indirect um, impacts on health. And then lastly, the, the, the intermediary determinants, which are really, the, um, which is part of what I really study, which is how these structural um, determinants shape exposure um, and access uh, to these risks, to these intermediary risk and resources. And some examples of these include material circumstances, right? Where someone lives, works, you actually heard Matthew refer to some of these um, behaviors and biological factors, um, and also exposure to psychosocial factors that can have direct effects on health and well-being. Um, in this case, we're talking about sleep or indirect effects through the way in which they affect um, the way in which individuals may engage with the health system. And so from that conceptual framework um, in my program of research, really uh, focusing on these intermediary factors uh, have in, in several studies shown how sociocultural stressors impact different uh, sleep outcomes among Latinx populations. Here are just three um, of those such um, papers and happy to talk in greater detail about them. Uh, but in, you know, in um, uh, one paper here on the left, we really were interested in a, in a large sample with over 5,000 Latinx adults. It's a population-based sample in the United States um, to, to examine how um, exposure to different sociocultural stressors, uh, such as exposure to ethnic discrimination and acculturation stress, which I'll define in a, in a minute, and also exposure to um, chronic stress were linked to um, different sleep outcomes. Uh, and what we found in that um, research uh, is that acculturation stress and ethnic discrimination were linked to insomnia in, in, um, in Latinx populations and also to uh, sleep duration. In, in a follow-up to that, we also found um, that there were consistent, uh, um, you know, uh, effects for or consistent findings for the effects of, of acculturation stress on insomnia symptoms. And I'll describe that paper in a little bit. Um, but it was again showing um, similar results using a more clinically meaningful uh, measure of, of, of insomnia. Um, and then lastly, it's not just in these quantitative studies, but also in our qualitative work where we've talked with um, Latinx adults, both English speakers and Spanish speakers um, who live in the New York City region to talk about their experience of insomnia, where um, they have often talked about the salience of acculturation or migration related stress and the impact of that uh, on their sleep. And just to you know, offer some definitions 
um, and why when I reflect on the social dimensions of sleep and, and in my work in particular, acculturation stress uh, really emerges as an important um, dimension to focus on. But acculturation stress can be defined as a psychosocial stressor. It refers to the psychological distress or worry that's associated with this multidimensional process of acculturation, which is the individual process of adaptation and integration resulting from contact within another, uh, an unfamiliar culture. Um, I think the main, you know, one of the key takeaways of, the, of this definition is that really um, the, the reason I, I also focus on, on acculturation stress is because of the emphasis on the distress and worry that it causes and the way in which that distress and worry through stress pathways can in turn affect health. So it's, you know, there's a, um, an entire acculturation process uh, that's multidimensional and that can focus on identity and other aspects, whereas this is really centered on how much distress is that process um, causing you and in turn how that's uh, affecting your health. And just sort of to highlight, these are different, I would say, you know, structural and intermediary um, social determinants that, affect, that influence um, how uh, that influence the acculturation process and the kinds of um, and level of acculturation stress that it's experienced. So some examples of these structural or intermediary social determinants in could include the extent to which there's cultural similarity um, between you know the the um, country of origin and and health and uh, host um, country, the language focus on. Um, uh, the, so the extent to which there's language similarity or language proficiency, uh, race, ethnicity, ethnicity, exposure to discrimination, the context of reception, so specifically the policies um, that might be a place, either you know, national policies and also local regional policies, migration policies that affect how immigrants are um, or you know, uh, different racial ethnic groups are integrated. Uh, so age at migration, the extent to which uh, they are existing uh, or uh, ties to the country of origin are maintained, um, the extent to which there are family ties at the um, site of, of migration or the settlement uh, um, or the settlement context, the place related um, factors. So thinking about who, um, you know, the setting in terms of where people end up settling and who the kinds of neighborhood and the kinds of um, ethnic, you know, whether they're settling in ethnic enclaves or thinking about ethnic density and also the socioeconomic status, both pre-migration and post-migration socioeconomic status. Um, so again, just highlighting here that this acculturation stress process, it's really not um, it's it's more than just this individual process. It's actually shaped and influenced by these structural and uh, intermediary social determinants that I described earlier, which we know have both direct and indirect impacts on health and well-being. Just going back to that um, paper that I showed you, I just want to sort of highlight that in um, in this paper, which was with over a thousand uh, Latinx adults, again, it's a population-based study in in the um, United States, we found that, um, again, the most consistent effects were found for acculturation and, and chronic stress, um, in that both of these were associated with increasing um, uh, insomnia symptom uh, severity. And this is accounting for, you know, um, sociodemographics, uh, uh, sociodemographic factors, uh, medical uh, confounders, et cetera. Interestingly, we also found evidence that this effect, this adverse effect of acculturation stress on insomnia symptom severity uh, was actually um, ex exacerbated um, among those who were unemployed. So this seemed to be particularly um, uh, uh, you know, to, to be particularly pronounced among those who are unemployed versus those who were employed. It's interesting because we um, asked, uh, we were also interested in understanding is, you know, is this um, effect and had initially hypothesized actually that uh, the negative effect or impact of acculturation stress on insomnia would be more pronounced among immigrants uh, than among those who were U.S. born. And in fact, we found that that did not hold up when we tested that in our, um, in our follow-up models. Um, so there was no moderation by nativity status. We also tested it for gender and found that there was no um, moderation. So meaning that, the, that, that negative impact 
um, of uh, acculturation stress on insomnia symptoms was, uh, you know, the same for self-identified men and women, the same for those who were U.S. born or who were immigrants to the United States. I think this point, this is, you know, again, going back to the social dimensions of sleep and my work, uh, which, um, you know, in my, in my work, I've, I've um, focused on, on sleep and have also have done uh, uh, some work on Latinx immigrant health and trying to understand um, the immigrant health paradox or so why immigrants, um, uh, you know, when they first arrive or settle into the United States, um, uh, in particular, they tend to have better health profiles compared to their U.S. born counterparts. Um, and then you do see some declines over time uh, with increasing uh, residents in the United States. But one of the hypotheses that's offered to explain these better immigrant health profiles focuses on social ties as sources of sociocultural protection for immigrants. Um, so that's the theory. When you look at the evidence, it's actually quite mixed. So it's pretty inconsistent that social ties for immigrants in particular can offer this sociocultural protection. Um, one, I think it's important to note that a lot, one limitation of that work is that it's often focused on US born, um, uh, US based ties instead of thinking, uh, taking a more global perspective to think about transnational social ties and the ways in which immigrants, um, especially uh, now more than ever, really have had to maintain ties to their countries of origin in these transnational ways. Um, also, just well, will add that adult um, immigrants have, in fact, smaller social networks than their US born counterparts, again, offering um, data that may counter this idea about the you know, social ties serving as sociocultural protection or that invites interrogation of this uh, potential um, of this theory to explain the immigrant health paradox. And just given some examples of these transnational ties, one, one really concrete example could be return visits. Again, in some ways I'm talking about a, a pre-COVID um, era in which that was easier to do. And again, that, that's also influenced by these structural determinants um, that I mentioned before, um, such as, for example, documentation status or proximity um, of uh, countries and travel. Um, another example of transnational ties is remittances, so sending money back home, also the use and engagement of social media, such as WhatsApp to really stay connected and engaged in the in the day to day. And from, you know, when, when you sort of take a, this um, 50,000 foot view of, of the literature on transnational ties and immigrant health, what it shows us is that, you know, it, it depends on the health outcome. In some cases, uh, transnational ties um, confer positive effects on immigrant health in that they may promote social support and a sense of belonging. Sending remittances can also be uh, a, um, an expression of altruism or a marker of upward social mobility. And that in turn, those two um, um, factors may actually buffer against the social stress that's related to migration or that acculturation stress that I referred to earlier. Um, on the flip side, transnational ties can have negative effects on immigrant health in that they might actually reflect um, the burden of cross-border caregiving or that these return visits or travel may actually reflect emergencies, so medical returns and, and family obligations. Um, they may also indicate family sense uh, separation and, in fact, actually uh, maintaining these transnational ties may exacerbate uh, poor mental health and um, contribute to social stress. So again, there's these competing hypotheses and depending on the outcome, you've actually have seen evidence for both. Interestingly, there has been, to date, there hasn't been any uh, literature that has focused on the relationship between remittance, uh, between transnational ties and sleep. In um, a paper that I've had the pleasure of working on that's in preparation with one of um, uh, a PhD student, uh, Luciana Giorgio, who um, uh, is leading this um, paper, we've examined uh, in a sample of medically healthy Latinx adults um, who, who are living um, in the New York uh, City region, the relationship between remittances and, and poor sleep quality. And what we interestingly found is that there was this, you know, um, main effect, but it was actually being driven among those who were employed. And so if you were employed and you said, yes, I'm sending money back home, your odds of poor sleep quality were almost you know, three times as higher than if you were employed and not sending remittances. If you were unemployed, actually whether or not you sent remittances did not um, was not associated with your odds for having uh, poor sleep quality. 
We also saw that, um, had observed similar findings when we examined uh, um, sleep, um, uh, sleep remittances and sleep duration, where uh, um, again, among those who were uh, um, who were employed, if they were sending remittances, they were sleeping uh, nearly 50 minutes less um, compared to those who weren't sending remittances. And again, there were no significant um, differences among those who were un unemployed. So just sort of some insights and, you know, what, what are some key takeaways, particularly focused on the topic of today, which is the social dimensions of sleep. And I'll just sort of highlight, I think if there's one big takeaway that hopefully you get from what I've shared today is that, you know, the social dimensions of sleep extend beyond the personal. And in fact, they include the structural dimensions as well. Um, again, you know, referring to the social determinants of sleep that I described earlier. Um, some examples of these intermediary social determinants of sleep can include um, the sociocultural stress uh, stressors that I described earlier um, in, in that we have found in, in our research that acculturation stress is a robust psychosocial correlate of insomnia that may actually promote vigilance and negatively impact the initiation and, and maintenance of sleep. Um, and then lastly, I, I think this I'm really interested in this transnational uh, cross-border ties and their implications for health. Um, contrary to other work, which I, I didn't go into, but we can go to, Maintaining these transnational ties has actually seemed to be, um, or at least remittance sending has actually seemed to be protective for mental health and for um, health. In this case, we actually found that sending remittances uh, may actually have adverse impacts on sleep duration and quality for Latinx populations. And that, you know, that could be related to limited opportun uh, opportunities for sleep. You know, perhaps these are folks who are working multiple jobs in order to be able to send money back home. But again, I think thinking about, um, it just extends our thinking about the kinds of ties and social connections that people are, are maintaining and in turn, how, you know, how that may be impacting their sleep. So just some implications to, um, uh, just some implications, I think, to conclude. It's really important, I think, to, um, measure how social risks and resources are influencing the acculturative stress experiences and their impact on sleep health. And, you know, I, I've shown you work that has focused on Latinx communities, but you you know, this would apply, I think, to any group um, and thinking about marginalized groups in particular who are living um, within a context in which there might be a, a, a minority or a, mar a marginalized group um, in, in society. And some of these social risks and resources, again, using this social determinant of health framework include exposure to discrimination, the extent of family support, the neighborhood environment, um, and the ways, again, in which that might shape exposure to these acculturation stress experiences that seem to be um, uh, particularly important for uh, sleep health in Latinx communities. Um, I think the second important um, implications is that in, in the United States, um, specifically, there's been a shift um, towards conducting social determinants of health screenings in the context of medical care. Sometimes these uh, social determinants of health screening may include asking about social factors and social supports and social isolation. I think what this work may be pointing to is I think the need to broaden those social ties assessments to consider the non-US based ties, but really transnational ties um, and the ways in which they may, you know, operate as sources of risk or resilience for immigrant sleep health. Again, I think the work that I just showed you um, uh, that is um, uh, the, the preliminary work that I just showed you really points to some interesting um, research, but that will need some further uh, replication with larger um, samples or, you know, more qualitative work, I think, to bear that out further. Um, and then lastly, I think there's a really um, great opportunity to leverage uh, sociocultural values that prioritize, you know, important social dimensions such as family, familial relationships and, and intergenerational um, social harmony to promote healthy sleep in Latinx communities. I'll just share that we um, are currently um, uh, enrolling in uh, for a hybrid um, effectiveness implementation study uh, where uh, the goal has been to take an existing evidence-based digital treatment for, for insomnia and culturally adapt that for Spanish-speaking Latinx populations 
um, primary care patients in the New York City region. And we've had to do a lot of a lot of the adaptation included these deep level adaptations that really were about um, shoring up the social in the intervention and shoring up the sociocultural values, the emphasis on, you know, really highlighting just, um, and, and, and I can talk more specifically about that if, if there's interest in the Q&A, but really um, following an, uh, um, a story that's uh, a vignette that's highlighting these intergenerational connections uh, between a mother and a, an adult daughter in terms of promoting that healthy sleep. Again, acknowledging, I think, some of the very topics that we're talking about today that are related uh, to the sociability of sleep. So I think before um, I officially conclude, just want to acknowledge all these different funding resources and the mighty, uh, the small but mighty team, uh, the Sleep, Mind and Health Research Program at Columbia School of Social Work and lots of community partners um, who are involved um, and facilitate this research along with many outstanding collaborators who I did not mention here by name. Um, and looking forward to the questions and this is just my contact information. Thank you so much, Carmela. Um, I'm really looking forward to the, the q and It was two really fascinating and uh, rich talks. And um, I'll just remind us a little bit of, of how we're proceeding here. So we have about half an hour left for a discussion. And we'll try to get to as many questions as possible. At this point, I'll invite you guys to use the chat to ask questions. Um, in the interest of time, I'll be asking your questions for you. So please feel free to use the chat for comments, to share information and for questions, and we'll get to every single question that we can. Um, I also just wanna to say to people who might be joining us a bit late, apparently some people didn't receive the Zoom link. We're really sorry about that. Um, we are recording the talks. And they'll be up eventually on our uh, website and so you can go back and um, tap into uh, what we've been talking about that way as well. Um, and just again, to invite anyone, feel free to submit your questions in English or in French. Um, we're happy to translate them. We'll be continuing the conversation in uh, English. Okay, so um, I, as we sort of wait for questions to come through in the chat, um, um, I maybe just want to start by something that I was really struck by. It was just a kind of commonality between where both of you began. Uh, Matthew, you talked about the bird's eye view, and Carmela, you talked used an expression that I haven't heard before, but that I really liked: the fifty thousand foot um, perspective. And it's so interesting. Um, the challenges, one of the main challenges that we have in thinking about sleep, is what it takes to toggle between those kind of wider views, um, these kind of encompassing perspectives um, that are, are one of the main ways I think that we see the I think often the severity of the problem of sleep in our everyday lives, and then the kind of intimacy of the rhythm of sleep. And one of the things that I think about with sleep a lot is the a kind of cruel optimism when it comes to being a good sleeper, to borrow Lauren Berlant's phrase, right? Every single night we go to bed and we think, well, maybe tonight's the night. <laughs> I'm going to get a good night's sleep. Um, and kind of continually investing in some kind of image of what it means to have good sleep and to have that as a kind of achievable form. Um, and I think this question of thinking about rhythm in your work, Matthew, is a very interesting way to kind of engage that. Mm -hmm. The sense of the kind of intimacy and the everydayness of our encounter with sleep um, and the kind of... Uh, the ways in which it invites us to be a participant in our own uh, relation to sleep. And yet some of the ways in which, um, I think one of the things that Alex and I both started this project from was a profound dissatisfaction uh, with the way that responsibility for good sleep is individualized. It's downloaded onto individuals and it's often divorced from these kind of social contexts. And thinking about the challenges that come in and re-articulating and re-connecting um, these social determinants of health and sleep to our everyday experiences, our every night experiences of sleep. And it's something that I wondered if you could talk about a little bit more um, uh, Carmela, you were talking about acculturation, and I think that's another interesting example of a kind of rhythmic relation, right? I mean, someone coming into a new culture is not staying in a kind of static relation to the novelty of that culture. There's an ongoing everyday opportunity to think about that. And I was very interested that you ended with the question of, of how we might ask better questions 
um, to approach some of these social determinants. You give the example of you know a mother and daughter. And I'm thinking about intergenerational acculturation too as one way to approach what it might mean like to think or to think of yourselves as new to a culture. Um, so I was hoping you could talk a little bit more about some of the work that you're doing with your team to adapt these apps, to adapt these kind of treatments and some of the challenges and also the successes that you've uh, faced in those projects. Yeah, happy, happy to start the conversation. I'm really curious um, um, to sort of hear uh, Matthew's edition. I actually felt like our talks, there was there was so, there was actually a good amount of, of synergy, and um, uh, I only wish we could go out for for tea or dinner afterwards. That would be a lot of fun. Um, I, you know, one thing I wanted just to say, Alana, is that this challenge of like where do you begin and where do you start, and the personal responsibility versus the social responsibility, I think is one. Um, it's an ongoing conversation, and and even among those of us, which hopefully I've convinced you, I, I am a clinical psychologist, but I understand the importance of these social determinants. But we, even um, um, I think among those of us who study the the social determinants of sleep, it's like we know that there are policy solutions that are needed, right? Like if you want to talk about fixing the policies, right, that contribute to shift work, to noise pollution, to light pollution, uh, to you know. Um, work policies. I think, Matthew, you gave such excellent like examples about just the, the way that our social lives are structured around, you know, child care that are sort of a mismatch and, and serve as competition um, for sleep. So there's like this debate about the necessity of focusing and advocating for policy level um, changes and some successes, right? Like the school start time um, changes in California and Seattle and some other places are great examples of that. Um, but at the same time, like people are suffering, right? And this is, I think, the clinical part of me, the clinical psychologist in, in me, that it's like you, there's like working, um, acknowledging the, the structural and working to address the structural at the same time, meeting that individual level need. Um, and I think in the app, that's part of what we try in um, this uh, grant that that uh, is active right now, that's part of what we're trying to do is like, how can we reflect in the content, the lived experience of social determinants while configuring and, in, and testing an app that's meant for one person to do. And so some, you know, some examples I, I mentioned, so we um, in this, this is uh, testing um, an FDA authorized digital um, therapeutic for insomnia. And so one example, which I was highlighting and you picked up on Alana is that we changed the main character. It was just a, um, a woman and her uh, spouse. We changed it. We, we thought, you know, and it came from our focus group participants. It made sense to feature, uh, you know, a woman um, in her mid fifties with this adult daughter who was in her twenties, who was really serving as her um, in many ways, champion right both to I think facilitate some of that engagement with it with an app um, and also I think in terms of helping to um, channel that information we, we also um, included references um, based on the conversations that came up in our focus group about acculturation stress that referred to experiences of racism and discrimination of, of being an immigrant and again this is an app that's being designed for Spanish speakers in you know who are primary care patients in the in the New York City um, hospital system, and so you know there's references and acknowledgement of these are kinds of stressors beyond the you know when you think about traditional stressors that might be acknowledged in um, or conceptualized in you know kind of traditional cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia like ethnic discrimination, you know, migration stress, those are not the typical ones, but those do appear in the app. So it's again, like, how do you reflect that lived experience of those social determinants in the app content and in the visuals and think really deeply and meaningfully about those um, changes? Thank you so much. I mean, I think, again, like just thinking about the images that Matthew began with, um, we're, as, as media scholars, we're very interested in um, thinking about these kind of media forms as doing more than simply representing um, or serving as a kind of intermediary, but the way in which they're really tied to the kind of fabric of our experiences, what, what it makes possible to even think and feel about questions of sleep. Um, Matthew, I wanted to ask you a question about agency, because um, I think it's such a fascinating part of your work. 
Um, in your book, The Slumbering Masses, you really use a kind of dual dynamic between desire and intimacy to try to get to this question of sleep that um, I think is very intriguing. And you talked a lot about dormancy. And I think, uh, again, like we'd like to think about how um, sleep on the one hand is often really challenged our notions of agency, particularly political forms of agency and social forms of agency. But I'd love to hear you say something more about how dormancy might reshape our notion of the social. Like, could dormancy ever be social? Could it be the basis for a, a more ethical form of the social? That is such a good question that I can't answer it. Um, and, and, uh, I mean, I always, so <clears throat> you, you get this towards the end of that talk, right? That like part of what I'm trying to think about is the, you know, really gendered characteristic of activity and how certain kinds of bodies are seen as active and other ones are seen as dormant, right, in particular moments. And so the, um, one of the, um, the things that I try and convey to students when we're talking about all the stuff, right, is that like dormancy is actually this um, space of political potential, right? And in a way, I cite Dorothy Smith in the, the paper, right, that like, there's a way that the household is really this politically um, uh, experimental site to kind of think about um, the labor potentials of care and, and from the household out thinking about how we can use those um, understandings of care to reshape what capitalist labor looks like more generally, right? I'm trying to own my flagrant Marxism right now, I guess. Um, <clears throat> but <laughs> I, I'll, I won't run away from it for right now, right? But that, you know, there's a way that um, in thinking about like those spaces of devalue or devaluization or um, off the page right now, right? That like in thinking about why those places are devalued um, from a dominant perspective, like, that opens up the possibility of articulating the practices that are happening in those dormant spaces in ways that unsettle the dominant power structure, right? And so when I was saying that um, I pair a week on sleep with a week on menstruation, as an anthropologist, we spend a, you know, there's a, a robust literature on like menstrual huts and the way that women's bodies are rendered dormant, right? They're like put away for their period of menstruation it, because they're dangerous to the societies that they exist within, right? And to think about the political potential of those spaces is something that feminist anthropologists have been really interested in over the years, right? And so similarly, thinking about the political potential for sleep and sleeping bodies in uncommon spaces is something that I've, I mean, I've always been kind of interested in it, right? And I always tell my students that if they fall asleep in class, that it's really a political act, right? Which is hard to capture in our Zoom age, but for people who are in person, you know, that like falling asleep in front of your professor really does something unsettling to power in that moment, right? If you're open to receiving it, the critique, I suppose. Thanks so much. I think that that sense of um, the what I've been thinking about is kind of the labor of being a body and the way that sleep both invites us to be more attentive to these kind of alter rhythms um, is something that I'd, I'd love to talk about a little bit more. Um, but I'm going to turn to the chat because we have some amazing questions in the chat. And the first question is for Carmela from Benjamin Reese, um, who writes, uh, wonderful talk. I wonder if conflicting cultural values around sleep itself might be a relevant source of acculturation stress, especially for immigrant populations that may be coming from societies that feature co-sleeping and or siestas, might adapting to new cultural expectations around sleep be a contributing factor to poor sleep? Thank you, Benjamin, for that excellent, um, for that excellent question. I think, you know, I think what you're um, proposing and hypothesizing makes a lot of sense. Um, I don't I don't think we have yet that literature to support it, but I would 100%, I think, um, hypothesize it in the same direction. One, you know, what's interesting is I'm thinking about some of the um, like public health education work that that 
will do, you know, my research team and I will do on the, on the side, which is just, you know, public health education around sleep and conversations um, with uh, Latinx participants around sleep. And it's really interesting because the adults, sometimes it's really hard to think about um, or engage in health behavior change talk around their own sleep. But when you talk about their kids sleep, it's like, oh, I want them to sleep well, you know, like, oh, well, oh, no, like I, I have to commute X number of, you know, minutes uh, to go to work. And so there's all these structural, right, barriers. Um, but wait, my kid's not sleeping and I need help and let's focus on, on that. So I think there's something about agreeing about the importance of sleep um, for the next generation that I actually think that there's a lot of room to leverage. I didn't think about what, you know, how can you develop, I think, an intervention that takes into account what um, some of those cultural norms uh, and pra practices and expectations are. But I think just reflecting back again around the sociability piece, like this intergenerational, um, I think, you know, I want to say commitment, but this um, emphasis on the next generation, I think that would be really, I think, promotive towards better sleep and could be used to think about like family, you know, like family sleep health as opposed to an individual's uh, sleep health. So a, a circuitous way of answering your question, but um, I hopefully you, um, some of those answers are, are helpful. Thank you, Carmela. Our next question is from Cressida Hayes, who says, great talks with great interaction. Matthew's analysis reminds me of Sarah Sharmer's work. In the meantime, uh, Sharmer shows how temporal economies, such as systems of waiting and acting, as for example, with cab drivers and frequent travelers, there's have a kind of power relation, who waits for whom. There's a disdain for waiting and also evaluation of doing uh, that Matthew reframed so well. But I wonder if power doesn't trump the reality of the distinction, thinking of Ariana Huffington and her reclaiming of sleep for good entrepreneurship. As I suggest in my own work and aesthetics of existence, there's a kind of mobility to the concepts of active passive or doing not doing that doesn't seem to attach to anything more than social value. Is dormancy most about lack of social value in a way that bizarrely supersedes the actual state or activity? Uh, thank you, Cressida, for the question. I, I think so, right, in that um, the what I'm trying to capture, right, is not the state itself, right, as like that sleep is a dormant state, right, but that it's um, treated as being something that like inert, um, but from a kind of dominant perspective that's influenced by capitalist, you know, you know production of value, right? <clears throat> and I think you're right that Huffington tries to, and you, you know, we see this over the course of the 20th century in a variety of attempts, right? That like try and recapture sleep as uh, productive, in some way, right? And um, often expressly in relationship to the protective potential of bodies, right? And um, Megan Brown has uh, good stuff about that and uh, particularly in relationship to workplace napping. Um, but, uh, and, and so I mean, part of what I really want to express, right, is the thing about dormancy, it goes back to Alana's initial question, right, like there is a political potential in dormancy, right, in that like because seeing activities as being marked as dormant or bodies being marked as dormant is one way to kind of um, uh, show the power relationship that's casting those bodies in particular kinds of positions and particular kinds of roles, right? So I think it's it's in some sense about inhabiting that dormancy in a way that disrupts um, that. I think it's the end of the sentence. Again, I very much wish we were in person here so we could have a more collaborative form of exchange, but thanks for these great questions, by the way, and I'm just going to keep moving through them because um, we have a lot of interesting things to talk about. Our next question is from Jean Ma. Hello. Um, how might analyzing sleep disorder as an outcome of social factors lead to new targeted treatment approaches? A 
great question, very central to what we're trying to do with the project as well. Um, this builds on Alana's initial question, and aside from interventions via policy, I wonder if Carmela could say more about tools she's developing, such as apps. There is an extensive therapeutic toolkit for sleep disorders now that runs from apps that track personal data to meds to sleep clinics. Do we need more, or do we need different tools for sleep as a social problem? Jean, that's such a great question. Um, you know, I I think um, I think you know what's interesting. I, I'm happy to talk more about the the app, and this is really a, a digital treatment. So it's taking what's considered the gold standard treatment for insomnia, which is cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, um, and taking uh, an intervention, a mobile based app that has FDA authorization, which is a first and, and pretty interesting. And when you think about accessibility, right, of being able to um, and, and potential even um, uh, insurance sort of coverage for a digital therapeutic that can be prescribed, there's a lot of, um, you know, when I think about it from a health equity side, there's a lot of potential benefit, right, to, to um, testing, developing, enhancing a product that is starting from that standing, from that starting point. But I do think that there's some limitations. So this is a treatment, you know, in some ways it's not just an app that's tracking, but it's based on the principles of, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, which is the recommended um, first line of, of defense. I do think that those are those individual level solutions. And as best as we can do to um, capture the, you know, lived experience of social determinants, it's, it's not the same as a community level intervention that's you know, addressing noise pollution or light pollution. And there can be community level interventions that do that or that bring you know, um, access to uh, sleep providers to specific neighborhoods that typically don't have you know, any, we, we canvas the New York City tri-state area for Spanish speaking, um, qualified providers in CBTI. And I think our list includes like 10 people. So there's very, there's so few. And I think that there's ways of thinking about, you know, multi-level um, interventions. Um, again, I, the, I do think like to address the big, those social determinants, what we need are like continue, um, uh, you know, advocacy and testing of these uh, more structural interventions. But in the meantime, I think, how do you how do you design interventions that are going to have um, a potential optimal impact at, at the individual level? Um, and with apps, we're not talking about it here, but there's a whole concern about like digital health equity and what does that look like? Which I think that might, you know, that might be part also of what you, of what you might be referring to, but thinking of, you know, really uh, foregrounding equity issues, I think in any kind of intervention development is really essential. Thanks so much. Um, our next question is from David uh, Cunnington, who writes, great talks and discussion, so true. Uh, question for Matthew, how do we bridge the void between clinicians who look at biology, pathocyte physiology of sleep and population patients who are living it, so more fo focused on experiential and social factors? <laughs> so I, I think uh, th this might, resonate with some of what Carmel was saying. And I, as people were talking about apps, I keep thinking about like a sleep tracker that asks you like, why are you awake right now? Or like, what did you do at work today? Like really trying to collect the social determinants of health questions, maybe in a kind of reflexive therapeutic way. I don't know, maybe that's just pure fantasy, but, um, but in any case, I mean, I, one of the reasons why I was really drawn to the clinicians that I worked with is because they really tried to not use pharmaceuticals. Um, <clears throat> and so um, not for all conditions all of the time, but they would try and work with patients and their families in the institutions that they were interacting with in order to address whatever the sleep problem was, right? And so often um, with students, they would like call principals and see if a kid could come into school late and stay late or, you know, do homeschooling for part of the day and be in school for the rest of the day. Um, because they recognize the kind of futility in putting a teenager on some kind of pharmaceutical, right, for whatever the 
condition was because they really saw it as not a sleep disorder, right? It was like part of maturing and that kids will grow out of it and you don't want to medicalize stuff, right? The, the flip side of it was that often there were patients who had really robust dreaming lives and um, sometimes those dreaming lives were really about social relationships and the deep uh, uh, psychoanalytic imprint in me could see that in a clinical situation, but the clinicians were always like, eh, it doesn't, it's not really important, right? And so there were often times where I would think like, actually this person is trying to express all these social conditions that like need some kind of, and they need some kind of help in managing what, whatever those conditions are in order to be better sleepers, right? But the clinicians were so expressly anti-Freudian, I suppose, that they didn't want to entertain those possibilities, right? So I think that, that the tensions around what counts as social and what counts as a symptom and what is a symptom of is something that really like was at play in the clinic. And when I would visit other clinics, um, they like the the social wasn't a question at all. Like it was really just like, what is the medical treatment that's been authorized for whatever this condition is? And it wasn't just dreaming that they disregarded. It was basically everything, right? And um, and so I, I think it, the. Uh, there's no like clear path on how to kind of change clinicians' minds, but I've tried over the years. Like I, when I give talks to clinicians, I really try and get them to think about the social um, and how attending to it might actually have longer lasting outcomes for patients and their families. I think we just have um, a little bit of time left. So I'm gonna ask one last question. This is from uh, Sandra Huber, who says, uh, I love the connection between menstruation and dormancy. Matthew, could you speak more about how you're researching those connections and what some further implications of that might be as you see it? One thing that comes to mind is how active the states of menstruation and sleep are, and yet how these are perhaps heterotopic spaces usually seen as private or removed and have specific intimate rituals developed around them to keep them contained. And I'll maybe just add that like one of the news things that I'm continually seeing as we're following sleep in the news is the new activism around um, uh, work provisions for menopause, which is also a massive site of insomnia as well. Um, so the idea that you might need to get time off work um, to go through menopause uh, and how that might be tied to thinking some of these questions as well. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So I'm not sure that I have a great answer for this, other than to say, or to tell you a story about how, like I have students write these things called biaries, where they're like biological diaries, where they're supposed to keep track of biological processes over the course of a week, and each week they focus on something different. And the um, women in the class are invited to track their um, menstrual cycle, and it uh, always, I tell them I'm like non-judgmental and I've been doing it for a long time, but their process, well, everybody's process, whether it's sleep or whether it's menstruation or anything else becomes really reflexive, right? And they become aware of all of the like little goofy idiosyncratic stuff they do around going to bed at night or waking up in the morning or their like other hygienic care for themselves. Um, but I always try and impress on them the um, isolating rituals that are associated with it. Um, because so many of the, especially the dormant processes that I'm talking about, right, are things that are meant to be private, right, as opposed to like eating, which is often in public, right. And um, getting them to think about the kind of ritual components of separation or collaboration in terms of eating or other kinds of public stuff is a way to get them to think about like the social um, and uh, like public context of whatever it is that they're doing, right. But um, thank you, Sandra, for that. Uh, continue to think about it. So we're out of time. 
Um, and I just want to take a last opportunity on behalf of Alex, Josh, Shalin, and myself to thank our amazing speakers. That was really wonderful and so rich and left us with a lot to think about. And I hope that you can come back for future conversations as well. Our next salon is in two weeks, October 13th, same time, different Zoom place with Kenton Croker, author of The Sleep of Others and the Transformations of Sleep Research, and Benjamin Reese here with us today, author of Wild Nights, How Taming Sleep Created Our Restless Worlds. And they're gonna be speaking on the future of the history of sleep. Thank you so much again and have a wonderful evening. We wish you all really great rest. Bye. <laughs>